the opening book of Ephesians. We might be a little short today, but just until the clock went on. Pull the time anyway. There you go. We guess to be foreordained. What word? We'll start in chapter 1 of Ephesians. Uh, I'd like to look at the topic of dispensations today. We don't talk about it much. It's, uh, I know what's often called dispensational theology is sometimes debated. I will preface by saying I don't think God saves people differently now than He used to, other than, Amen. Other than the fact they look forward to Christ and we look back to Him. Amen. But I'm not saying that salvation is different from one time or another, but God does deal differently with people throughout different ages. Mm -hmm. uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 10 <clears throat> It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times you might gather together in one all things in which both or in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. But here Paul is referring to a, a future dispensation, a future time when we'll all be together gathered together in Christ. Mm -hmm. There are four basic Dispensations and some subcategories, if you will, in each one. And we'll look in a moment at each of those, but there is the old world before the flood, there's the time between the flood and Christ, there's our current age, and there's the future age. Hey, Amen. But a dispensation is, is defined as a, a system of order, government, or organization of a nation or community, especially as existing at a particular time. It's basically just a a system of order, as it says, or way to or organize things in one particular time. Mm -hmm. So we have the age of grace is what we live in currently. We live according to grace and not according to the ordinances of the law anymore. Mm -hmm. But some people say that because God does not change, he doesn't deal differently with people in different ages, but that's not... <coughs> How the scriptures present God. Right. You see, throughout time he manifests himself in different ways. Just a simple study of the character of God in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, we see he was a very merciful God, but also a God full of judgment in the Old Testament. <laughs> and in the New Testament, he is very much a God of grace and long suffering. And time we will see he is very much a God of glory, isn't he? Amen. If we turn over to chapter 3 of Ephesians, we'll see. Here Paul very clearly shows that God deals with different people differently in different times. Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 5, he says, How that by revelation he, speaking of God, made known to me the mystery, or made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before, in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Those first five, though, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Amen. And there was a time when these things weren't revealed to God's people. Yet by the Holy Spirit, he says, now he's made them known unto the apostles and the prophets. Well, sometimes I think back of how God's people live with it's the early church. They didn't have the New Testament books that we do. Going back farther, the, the Old Testament saints, they didn't have the Gospels and such. And going even all the way back to Abraham, he didn't have any of the writings of God. Right. Yet they still served God. Mm hmm. These, we'll start with the first dispensation, the old world before the flood. It can be described in two parts. Uh, before the fall, some might call it a time of innocency. For, mm -hmm. That's very plainly made by their, they were without sin before the fall. Mm -hmm. But according to Genesis 3, verse 6 and 7, they took of the fruit and then they 
knew good and evil, and they was real when they were naked. We can turn there for just a moment. We'll see. <laughs> Adam and Eve were created really perfect and innocent. See verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that, there, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye, and the, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave it to her husband, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice verse 7 and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Mm -hmm. And they are no longer innocent anymore after this time. Hey, bad. So we we know the results that came from this: how the sin entered the world, death by sin, and so death is passed on all men for all of sin. Paul says, and all the curse that came along with it. And then we enter into the time between here and the flood, where man just became exceedingly sin, more and more sinful. Right. We go over to chapter 6, and we're all familiar with these passages here, but Genesis 6 says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, verse 1, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, <clears throat> and it says, and angels, and, and human women, by the way. This is supposedly good. Godly men and ungodly women with right. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days also excuse me, and also after that, when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm -hmm. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing in the fowls of the air, for repent me that I have made him, or made them what Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. So here we see this time when man just did that which he wanted to, really. And he, right. He only took approximately, I think it was 1,300 or 1,600 years from Adam to Noah. It didn't take very long for man to become exceedingly sinful. Mm -hmm. So much so that God said he would destroy the world. <coughs> we turn over to Second Peter, Second Peter here. Peter describes this, but some people in his day were ignorant on the topic. Second Peter chapter three. Verses 5 and 6, people were really mocking and ridiculing and scoffing at the second coming of Christ. He says that all things are continuing as they were from the beginning. But in verse 5, he says, For this they are will willingly ignorant of that by the world, or excuse me, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Mm -hmm. See, God, due to the great wickedness of man, wiped out the old world. That world sometimes called the antediluvian age, but you can suffice to say it's the, the world before the flood. And God would wipe it out, start over with Noah, and make the promise to Noah to he would no longer flood the world, destroy man, but he would give us the rainbow instead. Mm -hmm. Then from there, there's we go on from that time until the time of Christ, which covers most of the Old Testament. Uh, you might break it down in two parts. First, beginning from Abraham to Moses. There, they lived according to the promises of God, such as we see in Genesis chapter 15.
immediately after, or shortly after, I should say, that God called Abram out of his home land in Bolton to get to the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Pick up in Genesis 15, verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that hath he that shall come forth out of thine own vow shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now to the, toward heaven and tell the stars, and thou shalt be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Amen. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. Amen. Here we see the first of the promises that would come between the time of Abraham and Moses when God would promise the seed to Abraham and then through Isaac and to Jacob. You might call this the time of the patriarchs it's when Jacob and his 12 sons lived. and Eventually they went into bondage in Egypt. But they still had the promises of God to rely upon. Amen. And then we know God spoke to Moses and had him to lead God's people out of Egypt, and then we have the time of the law from that for that time until Christ came. We'll turn over to John chapter one. So John giving a description of Christ and describing how that he is God and he and how that John bear witness of him. Verse 17 it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. I think, I think we're all familiar with the law and what it is, and, and it entails a large portion of the Old Testament, and that's how the, the nation of Israel was governed and what they were to live by. But from that, that only lasted up until the time of Christ, and Christ would come and he would fulfill the law. That brings us to our current age, which we often call the age of grace. Mm -hmm. We can see this in Romans chapter 6. One reason why I wanted to cover this topic is because I, I do intend to, or do feel led to the Lord to look through the book of Romans, and Paul deals with all these dispensations to Amen. some degree. <coughs> Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over ye, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What Amen. Is, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Amen. Now we are no longer under the law, but under grace, he says. This is, that's why we often call it the age of grace. We live not by the confines of the law, but we are free from sin under his grace. But as Paul says here, that doesn't mean we're free to sin. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's what he says back in verse 2 of chapter 6. And some would separate this time from the tribulation because, depending on whatever your end times theology is, but God will turn back to national Israel and say, Amen. Amen. We see this in chapter 11 of Romans. No matter what your eschatology may be, you can't deny that God will save Israel. Amen. One day, when he says that, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. We've been talking about how the, the we are the wild olive branch and been grafted into the natural tree which is Israel, spiritually speaking, and that they have been cut off for a time. But for I would not have you, brethren, that you, or for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant 
of this mystery that you should be wise in your own conceits. So he was dealing with the Romans, these people in that time were boasting that they were they had been the chosen people of God. Mm-hmm. But we have no reason to boast because God has chosen us. Anything is to take that. He goes on to say that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as written there come that shall come out of Sion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant of them when I shall take away their sins. I don't know precisely when the fullness of the Gentiles will be coming in, but right. I do know it's one day the last Gentile is going to be saved. He's going to, if I understand correctly, then he will turn to Israel and say, right. he will deal with them once again, as we see yeah. very clearly in the book of Revelation. But after that time, after that time of that the Bible calls great tribulation, then will become the future age where sin is abolished. It was mentioned back in our text. We can see in a few places, uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. That's what we feed in chapter 2, verse 7. Sorry. It says that that in the ages to come, or, yeah, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this is the future age which we speak of when we shall be brought together in Christ and we shall be with him. Second Peter describes it as well, Second Peter chapter 3, after he tells that the world is going to be destroyed by fire, the heavens, and the earth. Second Peter 3, and verse number 13, he says, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen. This is <clears throat> the age in which we look forward to. The, Amen. The dispensation which we look forward to where sin is abolished, where we'll be forever with the Lord. That has not come yet for the, for the people of God. I guess we will be with the Lord when we're absent from the body, but In the fullness of time, when we come to pass, when we put on a new body, the glorious body. Amen. In the of Revelation, look at a couple more places before we close. Revelation chapter 20. That some might, might divide this quote dispensation into two different time frames. One being the millennial reign of Christ, which we see in the first five verses of chapter 20. Revelation, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key at the bottom of the pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and the bad, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should precede the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon his foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Amen. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Mm -hmm. Here we see this, what we call the millennial reign of Christ, and this I believe it's a literal thousand year reign of Christ upon the bad, which I think is described as him ruling with a rod of iron. And Satan is bound for this time. And I don't know how everything will transpire exactly, but it says that we, 
May God's people will rule and reign with him. But it doesn't say that death and sin have been done away with yet. Right. So we, you know, the rest of the chapter here, he goes on after this thousand years is up and Satan is loosed and the last battle is fought and he is cast in the lake of fire and what we often call the great white throne judgment occurs mm -hmm. and all the unsaved are cast in the lake of fire and then begins what we might call the rest of eternity which is if we should dwell with God and be completely free from sin not just us, but everything around us. There'll be no more curse, no more death. Amen. We see just a, a glimpse of this in the first five verses of the next chapter, Revelation 21. He says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride born for her husband. Amen. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither Amen. shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. So here we see the beginning of this age in which we shall really, we shall never end, shall we? It will be forever with the Lord, as Paul says in Thessalonians. I don't know. We'll all occur, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot here, but I think we'll worship and learn more about God for all eternity. You're right. Amen. And this is the, the final dispensation, if you will. This is, for us, as a child of God, this is where we will be for all eternity. But for the young say that Lake of Fire is where they will be. Mm -hmm. But these are the, to the four basic dispensations, and it, it is important to understand how God deals with people differently in different times. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean he he saves different in different times. No, he, he's always required faith. We see that all mm -hmm. the way back to Abel, that he had faith. Of course, Cain slew him because of his faith and his pain. Or excuse me, because Cain didn't have faith. Right. We're going all the way forward to our time, and I think even the Tribulation Jews, they will have to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So after that, we won't need faith anymore. Amen. We will be with our Lord for all of eternity. So how we we live in this current evil world, we get it's not our final home. Right. Maybe the very gracious and long-suffering God, but one day he'll put that long-suffering down in his full wrath will be poured out. That's why I say he, he deals with dif people differently in different ages. Right. We as Gentiles were barely even thought of throughout the majority of the New, excuse me, the Old Testament. Right. Now that in our current age, the Jews have been largely Forsaken, if you will. Mm -hmm. He hasn't cast off his people forever. Amen. But he has a remnant <clears throat> for the remnant of grace, Paul says. We get blindness and part has happened to him until the fools of the Gentiles be coming. Amen. This is the, we currently live in the time of the Gentiles, but one day it's coming to an end. You know how we ought to look for that day in which we shall be forever with him. But until then, we need to be busy about serving him, busy about trying to understand more and more of his word and drawing closer to him. In fact, we are to encourage or exhort one another. He said it daily when I was called that. If I understand the scriptures much at all, I know the times are not going to get easier for God's people. That's right. 
this current age will soon be coming to an end, I believe. But until that time, we got to be busy about serving Him. Amen. So, close with that. Mm-hmm.